Okay, thanks. And welcome, Elaine. Nice to see you again. And welcome, Ken. So, um, is Nicole, I don't have one of the languages selected. It, Spanish is not lit up. Do you have it set English to Spanish? I do. Yep. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm seeing both. Okay. Should I go ahead and turn it on? Yes, go ahead and turn it on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so can everyone hear me? Excellent, okay. So uh, we are gathered to talk about your questions about the small tier of the core RFP application. And we recognize that some of you are still deciding which tier you're actually applying for and that you may have some other questions. And so just again, N Nicole and I are here to offer some general support and to um, point you towards some resources, either from core coffee chats or core tools or other resources that we're aware of that would be helpful to you. And of course, we wanna help you prepare the strongest proposal possible. But if you have very specific questions about the application process or the online portal, we'll direct you to the human services department. Um, and some of th those resources. And just in case people hadn't seen it, the, um, the HSD, the Human Services Department team, did post an initial set of responses to questions that have been received so far, and they will keep doing that. Um, so Nicole Young just posted in the chat the, uh, the link to the HSD uh, core RFP site. So you can see that there. So we also uh, thought that it would be nice to start off with some introductions. So some of you may know each other and some may not. So I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the co-facilitators for Core Investment. And I have my colleague, Nicole Young here. Good morning, everyone. And we've introduced Stella Larman, who is on the Spanish channel and not only interprets our live sessions, but also translates our materials and handouts. We're grateful for that. So Shonda, would you like to start? Maybe just sure. say a word about your organization. And Yeah, I'm a board member at Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. So I've been a board member for the last year and a half. Um, in my day job, I work in the tech industry. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, okay. I'm located, located in Palo Alto, California. Great, thank you for joining us this morning. And it's so nice to see Recovery Cafe uh, staff and board experiencing this as a team. So thanks for that. Elaine, would you like to go next? Hello, uh, thank you for your work, you guys. It's really uh, valuable. Uh, my name is Elaine Salter and I'm a co-founder for the cafe. Thank you, Elaine. And Ken, how about you? Sure, uh, an another uh, Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz uh, board member, founding board member, uh, but uh, nonprofit career consulting. I also was the former executive director of the San Jose Recovery Cafe and and do other work with other lots of other organizations as well. So, yeah, but, but here today for for uh, Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. Great, welcome. Thanks for being here. And Rafa. Hold on just a second. I'm uh, turning on my camera. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you for doing that. Hi, um, I'm Rafa Sonnenfeld. Uh, I think all of us here are with Reco Recovery Cafe. Um, I'm also a uh, founding board member. And uh, in my day job, I uh, work for a uh, uh, pro housing nonprofit. Great. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Stacy. Hello, my name is Stacy Kyle. Um, I'm here representing two organizations, um, an organization nonprofit I started that I'm a volunteer board president for the Live Oak Education Foundation. And then I'm a consultant uh, working on an application for Saludi Crino, both of which are located in Live Oak. Thank you. And Serge. I'm Serge Cagno, uh, Executive Director of Recovery Cafe, and you've met four of my bosses, my <laughs> board of directors on the call, too. Recovery to Cafe represents. That's great. Thank you. And, and Serge, we are, we are um, 
both you and Stacy are uh, consistent presences in the core coffee chats and conversations, and we do appreciate that. And so um, some of you may know this and some may not, but there are lots of resources um, available beyond these group office hours and the individual um, TA that some of you have signed up for. And so we just encourage you to um, access any previous recordings and for, and share the information if people weren't able to be here live today. We're recording this, as you know, and we'll keep, we'll keep doing that same pattern for all of our training and TA offerings so that as many people as possible can have access to it. And then I just wanted to remind everybody that, um, that we're just here to help. And so we have the trainings listed, Nicole's listed those in the chat that are coming up. So we have some more specific training on, on tools that can be used that, that should help with the application process. And today is really to answer your questions though. And, and again, we recognize that you may not have all your questions yet, but to the extent that you have them, we do have um, a Google Doc set up and I'll put a link in the chat. And so if you want to navigate your way there, um, that's one way to pose a question for us to try to answer. And then if you'd rather just raise your hand or just turn off your mic and jump in, um, we welcome any way you wanna send questions to us or put a question in the chat, we'll do our best to respond. So, um, What's on your minds so far? Has anyone had a chance to look at the application? Stacy has a bunch of questions. Okay. <laughs> do you do you want to get us going, Stacy? What's on your mind? Um, well, and there's such a group from Recovery Cafe that I I definitely want to defer and let them do their planning, but I do have a question for them. Have they tried to log in yet? Because I can't log in. I set up my account and I keep trying and the pop-up window keeps, and I know that's not a Nicole question, but- you mean like I an in-reviewer? You're trying to in log in the, the online portal. Okay. Yeah, I set up an account this morning and it just, hmm. I'm not able to get in. So I didn't know if it was just me or if anybody ah. else has had that problem. Okay. Um, I haven't tried yet. Okay. All right, so I will reach out to HSD, it sounds like. Um, do well, you I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that you had a glitch right out of the gate, but it's, um, it's a reminder of check out the reviewer sign-in process sooner rather than later, because that's not something you want to be figuring out on the day of the, the day the proposal is due. So I know it's small yeah. comfort. It's frustrating to encounter that right away, but... Well, I was glad because it was like, okay, now I was, especially because I knew I'd be seeing people today. So I could yes. just, and I'll, I'll be seeing you in future sessions. So I'm just going to ask them too. Yeah, um, great. That's fine. Is it okay if I just go down my list and Recovery Cafe just interrupts if they have a, a different question yeah. related? Yeah, and Absolutely. it's very possible you have same questions. So go okay. right ahead. And, and I have taken a look at the application, but not in a whole lot of detail. Okay. Um, and I feel like that some of my questions are dumb. So that's all my prefacing. Okay. No, um, actually, let me stop you right there. <laughs> um, no questions are dumb. And some of our answers <laughs> may, may not meet your needs, but we, um, that, that's why we're doing this, so that people have an opportunity to ask all questions. And so please lose, th lose that label. Um, okay. Some people are brand new to grant writing. I know you're not. And some people have issues with technology and some people are new to core and the core conditions. We, we really wanna level the playing field as much as we possibly can. And this is part of it. And there are other ways to try and do that. So please, I don't want anybody to feel like there's a dumb question. And if, um, if you have a question, it is, I, I, would, I would venture to bet 100% likely someone else has that question. So not All right, thank you. And now I remember I'm also being recorded. So I'll yes. just own that. Yes. Um, okay, so um, there's a line at the very beginning about amount of funding requested. My guess is that's the total over the three years. So if I'm asking for five a year, I would put in 15. Is that correct? Or is it the annual that we're asking for? 
Well, that's a good question. I think, I think it might be annual and I'm not 100% oh. sure. Okay. Now I'm glad I asked it. What do you, Nicole, do you not happen to know? Um, I am not remembering off the top of my head either. So I'm looking at the application right now to see, because I know that they ask for information a couple different ways. And the reason I say that, Stacy, is that I think that is how the award tier I think we should probably put that on a list of questions yeah. to follow up with HSD about and have them clarify that. Okay. Excellent. See, Stacy, you're already helping. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm so glad. I really thought that was my dumbest question, too. Oh, absolutely not. Mm. Um, it does fall pretty quickly after the tier question. So maybe, yeah. maybe it is the annual. Um, okay, good. Is it okay to ask for the full amount of the project budget? from core. So if we have an agency budget of 50,000, this is a new project we're going to ask for say 5,000 a year. Can we ask for 5,000 a year? I mean, if that's what the project costs, can we ask for the full amount? As opposed to Show you know, have core fund the entire project that you're looking yeah. at? Um, yes, I think that is up to you to request. There are various points in the application that ask you to, to differentiate the portion of your work that is funded through CORE from portions that are funded elsewhere. So you just wanna be careful about what, where, what you're describing where. Okay. But if that is your, um, if that is the way that you need to structure this or you is your intent to, to fund a piece of something in your organization through core, um, that is what you should describe and put into your budget. That being said, uh, a lot depends on the amounts. And so there might be other considerations like um, it might be a stronger, I'm not saying this from a reviewing or scoring perspective, but just from a point of view of what gets, um, what has support in other ways and might have a greater chance of sustainability or, you know, it just, this is one of those things that really depends on what, what you're asking for, you know, how much and how much, um, how that budget decision fits with your overall agency capacity and um, the relationship to other programs and just what, what it means for your organization. Is it, is it 5,000 out of 50,000? That might be more reasonable than 45 out of 50,000, right? So. Yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. That help? Mm hmm Yes. Nicole? I guess I would add to like there, um, so there might be some responses to where Nicole and I might say like, <laughs> like we're, we're not in the role where we can officially answer that. Here's how we would, you know, suggest how you think about it or things to take into consideration. So, like in the RFP, I don't believe there's anything that says you can't apply for the full amount of a program. So there's nothing that says like that would be prohibited. What um, I think the really helpful thing that Nicole just described is then thinking about like, okay, okay, what might that look like or how might that come across to a reviewer if you are requesting. Um, from core, basically the entire program budget, and then what and what might happen if you don't get funded. So it's kind of like a then it becomes your choice about how much kind of risk, right? Do you want to take in terms of what you're requesting from core for your program budget? Because if you you know if you request the whole budget and it doesn't get funded, um, the you know the way that the RFP describes the funding decisions the county and state are going to aim to fund as close to the full request as possible within like a I think it's like a 10 percent mm -hmm. you know range um and so there you know again since we don't know the specific scoring criteria we don't know how reviewers will will you know score proposals and all of that it's just a lot of like kind of weighing some of those different 
factors and possibilities as you're as you're making decisions about what to request. Okay. Yeah, I'd say that that's my biggest question too. Is it? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Like how much, like, because the different programs, I mean, how you evaluate what's a useful program or what has the most diversity or which core conditions you address or whether you're a new program an innovative or an old program wanting to grow um, that has some history. Um, yeah, the money can be used for all those depending on how you wanna look at that. And it's exactly like which amount of money would be most likely to be funded. Like, well, I need money all sorts and I need a bunch of money. So mm -hmm. I, that question of which one to ask for, um, I don't know what's in other people's heads about how they're gonna evaluate. Like I know I've, I've been on these things and how the evaluation, what's scored. Um, but that that particular question of exactly how much. Um, and at the moment, I'm leaning, leaning towards the medium tier um, just because the number of awards, um, though where exactly we'll, we'll be applying. Uh, yeah, it, it feels like I'm sort of rolling a little bit, rolling, rolling dice in the dark. And so one suggestion would be, you know, I know with um, your, your whole team is listening to these sessions and working on, working on some strategy and what to think about. So you may want to use some of the logic model theory of change type tools that we talked about yesterday or, or watch the recording of that um, and El Elaine can walk you through it <laughs> um, and think about where, where your greatest contribution would be. You know, where, is it something, and you define that, is it where your strengths are as an organization that are unique because nobody else is doing what you're doing? Is it because you're reaching a population that no one else is reaching? Are you in a part of the county that no one else is active in? What, what stands out about your approach that, um, that is just, that differentiates you? So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is maybe you're doing something that's similar to others, but it's an expansion of different kinds of efforts or it's um, implementing, uh, uh, taking to a greater scale something that's been success successful el elsewhere or addresses a certain kind of gap. Or there's so many ways, as, you, as, you, as you've noted, Serge, of pitching what you're doing. So I would say go through the exercise of figuring out where you think your greatest assets and contributions are, where you play to your strengths, and work back from that. Um, maybe that lands you in this tier versus that tier, this strategy versus that one. Um, and you may not have the same opinions about it. So that's part of what's great about these discussions is maybe um, Rafa and Ken think X and Elaine and Serge and Shonda think Y and you can persuade each other or find some way to meet in the middle and have a really interesting discussion about where you see Recovery Cafe's future. But you're right, Serge, you can't really know the, the minds of reviewers, who else is applying for what. You just have to give it your best shot based on what you think your strengths are and what you are offering. And that's, that's what we hope these tools will help you do is put your, your best story forward, your best thinking, your best alignment of your effort. And, um, and that's all we can do at this point, right? Yeah, and I, I think mentioned in our earlier, um, sorry, Elaine, I mentioned in our earlier uh, discussion that one of the hopes we have is that even if people are not successful in their funding request, that they will have materials that they can use for other um, pitches. And, you know, we, we wish that everybody who applies could get funded. That's just not reality. So we also hope that the process of doing this has some other uses besides just the core RFP. Elaine, I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, no, I, 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 that, so the suggestion of going through the model yesterday together as a team, I think is gonna be super helpful about drilling down to which direction and, uh, and the exact pitch that we hone into, I think is gonna be super helpful. 
I'm grateful for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, on the prior question, Stacy, I was just able to log into Reviewer and set up an account. And then once you set in the account, set up the account, did it let you back in to actually? Yeah, I, I answered one question and then Dave logged out, cleared the, and then started again and made sure that it, it was re-logging in. Huh. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. So it is Try me. it again, sister. Hopefully <laughs> when, I'll let you. <laughs> when I was on the website, sort of a pop-up came up and it said, put in your uh, login and password, even though I hadn't created one yet. So I had to X that turn and then find the spot of create. Um, and Let me ask you this. Once you set it up, when I go back, it has the login window already populated, but also that pop-up window comes up out on top of it, that white box. So both of them are there and yeah, I'll enter there and it doesn't work and I'll X out of that and enter below and it doesn't work. Yeah, I wasn't using that little box thing that was annoying me and I wasn't trusting it because I didn't know if it was using my the cookie that I already would logged in. So yeah. I was using the login button separately. Yeah, I wonder if there's some cookies or autofill issues too. Uh, we, we will, we will forward that to HSD, but um, as a, an issue, but, and I know, Nicole, I think Reviewer has its own help tickets. They have their own help tickets and Alex is going to be on, I forget which session she said she would be coming back for. Alex Dami from HSD is kind of the uh, guru for <laughs> how to use Reviewer. She's the one that did the the training earlier this month. And so I know that Stacey, you, you're signed up for one or two more sessions today. If Alex is in one of those sessions, that would be a good, you can feel free to ask that question at that time. Okay. All right. I'll keep playing with it too. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes that works. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep hexing out and I'm going back. <laughs> sometimes I have to create um, whole new accounts just because I, 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 uh, poor Serge. <laughs> He knows, <laughs> he does, but it, you know, it grows you being patient. <laughs> this is true. No. All right. You guys are going to have to duke that one out. <laughs> so Stacy, are we convincing you that these are not dumb questions? Yes. Okay. Thank I, have you. A, I have a data question next. There okay. Are, there's tables for the federal poverty levels. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. That's a good question. And there's like the scale of household size. And then you ha there's the table we populate. And I'm wondering how federal poverty levels relate to free and reduced lunch, because I use student demographic data. I've never used federal poverty level data. I don't know how they link. I think they're in alignment. My understanding about that is that... Um, so to qualify for free and reduced lunch, you have to be um, un, in the in the lowest, you know, the po the poverty level anyway. The right, two hundred percent below. Yes, I that's my understanding, but I could be wrong about that. Okay, I don't know the answer offhand, Stacy. I know there's a relationship between the two. Nicole, do you know? I just looked something up real fast. It looks like um, children and households with incomes at or below 130% of the federal poverty level are eligible for free school meals. And then there's a different threshold for reduced price. Looks like there's actually a couple, a few different. I think there's also, or at least there used to be, if, a, if the, uh, if that federal poverty data for the neighborhood or for that, you know, however it was defined, it was at a certain percent that a hundred percent of the kids would qualify. So there would be no asking for, um, really? for the data for individual kids. So there's, there's, so there may be some districts or some schools that are a hundred percent free or reduced, but that doesn't mean that it's that a hundred percent of the kids would qualify if it were a district where everyone had to present their own data. That's a good point. That's actually the, the case for my child's school. Um, but, we, but we still have to fill out the form. Cause like we personally don't qualify but because she goes to that school, we benefit. 
but we still fill out the data. We still submit the form mm -hmm. saying what our household income level and family size is. But right. it, it doesn't sound, if it's 130%, I don't have the table in front of me. I thought it was 100 and then 200. Um, so I don't know how to find that data then. It doesn't match to my population. I don't know what to That's do. frustrating. Um, you, let's see, I have to think that through. Um, would the union, the, the school um, district have that information? Um, the only thing I've ever seen was free and reduced, but I've never asked for this. So I could ask for it and see if they have it. I bet you they would. And then Stacy, you know, <clears throat> I don't, I don't, I'm not in data share at the moment, but it might be worth looking at, um, just some, to see what's available by zip code slash census tract slash parts of county county division so that um, geographic division so that it might be possible to use something as a proxy measure that you could um, explain in your text. That's a good about, idea. We don't have the exact data, but we think it's in this tier because of yeah, this other indicator. Yeah. You kind of triangulate what, you know, we have these three clues that tell us approximately where this is. Sure. And I think if you explain um, that you have had, had an estimate, because other people are going to have the same issue, that you, you're not going to have the exact number for the exact population. And I, I see elsewhere in the application where it says estimates are fine when you're estimating the number of people. So I, I will double check this, but I would not get hung up on the exact, um, I think if you, if you have an approximate percentage or proportion that nobody's going to come after um, looking at, you said you had 82 people in, under the federal poverty level and it's really 84 people or 72 people. Don't worry about that kind of thing. This is not a, um, this is not tracking for that purpose, it's to try to understand um, the, the degree to which different applications are serving the most vulnerable, disenfranchised, um, economically um, fragile families and individuals in our county. That's what that's about. Okay. All right, great, thank you. That kind of yeah. lowers my stress every time I scroll past that one. Don't stress over that. <laughs> I have a, another uh, data question, but on the, uh, effectiveness side on, on our data, so related okay. to, uh, you mentioned earlier about um, proposals that are about scaling a program, and that's <laughs> in effect, you know, in effect, you know, is uh, Curve Cafe Santa Cruz, we're our, our own independent local nonprofit, and we're just kind of get started, but we're affiliated with Recovery Cafe Network, so for effectiveness data, we don't have a lot ourselves yet, so is, is it going to be okay if we rely on network data showing the uh, effectiveness of this, of what we're replicating, of, you know, showing the effectiveness of this approach to recovery? Yes. Um, and so we have one of our upcoming trainings on the core tools. We'll talk about the continuum of results and evidence, the core continuum of results and evidence. And that's a, a tool that can help you um, make the case for what you do and do not know about your program's effectiveness and why you think it would be effective here based on where it's been effective elsewhere. So, so there are different, um, different ways of classifying where your program is on that continuum. So you might say, it's brand new, it's a new idea, we're just testing it out, this is a brand new pilot, and then, then you would understandably have less information about effectiveness because that's what you're trying to figure out. Or you may say this has been looked at elsewhere. We have some tantalizing clues about its effectiveness that tell us that it has potential here. And here's why we think that. So maybe it's, I, I don't know what that data is. I'm not familiar with your network, but presumably there's something in your 
um, the other recovery cafes that tells you that there's a model or you know maybe you're adapting it in some way for for Santa Cruz but there's something to that model that makes you think that it's going to work here and you, that's what you're telling that's the story that you're telling why yeah. why it, you think it would work here and why it's needed here when is this training is this also part of um, a list somewhere that you could maybe send yes and I think Nicole will put a link in the chat okay thanks that yes. would be very useful coming right up and um, the tool itself, you don't have to wait for the training or um, we, we, of course, encourage everyone to attend the training, but the tool itself, we'll put a link to, it's a, it's a PDF document. Uh, right now it's living on the data share platform. Um, so if you just want to glance at it, um, we'll, we'll put that in there too. So there's the training link. Thank you, Nicole. Um, but Ken, it's a great question and it's something that... Um, that others will have as well about, you know, where, when you, when you're replicating a program from elsewhere, you don't have local data yet, but you do have, the reason that you're trying to replicate it is because you have a belief based on something that it's going to work here. And that's what you're describing. And Ken, I was just looking at the recovery cafe network website and I see that there's, you know, Part of it being a network is there are, there are other sites do any of those other sites uh have evaluation data using tools that are standard across Absolutely. the different recovery cafes that you all plan to use and if they have yeah. a history of outcomes that's something that you could refer to so even though you you haven't uh produced that data yet locally basically what you're saying is we're uh applying the same model here using these standardized tools. They've been shown to demonstrate these outcomes in other locations throughout the country. We expect to be able to produce the same or deliver the same. Absolutely, yeah, there's there's tons of data going yeah. back to 2004 in the original cafe in Seattle. So yeah, as the yeah. network has grown, there's yeah more and more, and, and, and it is fairly standardized, the, the um, survey data from cafe to cafe. It's like each individual local might collect some additional data, but right. the core data is reported in the same way back to the, you know, the home office in, in Seattle to be compiled into network data. So that yeah, makes total sense, good. and and um, and you'll have a jump start on writing your outcomes as well. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Stacy, did you have another question or? I do. <laughs> okay, do it. Maybe they'll maybe ask my question. I won't get embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what the reporting requirements are going to be for the small tier application, if successful. Well, that's a, that's another question we may send over to HSD. My understanding is that um, the reporting requirements are. Um, streamlined for the smaller um, proposals. Nicole, do I have that right? I think that's the intent. So just like yeah. the applications are get increasingly complex, you know, the higher the tier, the same principle will apply to the reporting requirements, but I don't think they've actually um, created those or decided what those reporting requirements will be. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and sometimes the, you're right. Sometimes those are included in the RFP as a kind of a, an, a heads up. These are your obligations. If yeah, especially as a small volunteer organization, it's kind of nice to know for this amount of money, how much work are we? Yes, having to do on the back end, you know, yes. beyond the project. Understood, and we will we will forward that. Okay. Yeah. Having that answered before applying is useful. Like I actually know one nonprofit that's not applying because they have no energy towards reporting um, and they do private donations. So knowing how much time is going to be needed for, for me on, you know, the different. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's part of the calculation, the yeah, cost benefit that's... calculation, understood. <laughs> I only have so many hours, so, so yeah. I have to allocate, you know, how much I'm going to put into each thing, you know, for the understood. next year. And I guess one thing I would say, because it's it's possible even, I mean, I think your point is completely understandable, Serge, and <laughs> I would feel the same way too if I were 
applying for the grants. Um, and it's also possible that HSD will, their answer will still be, we don't know yet, we haven't decided or created those reporting requirements. And so then one way to think about it is, you know, for the different tiers, um, you know, it's probably safe to assume that the demographics that they're asking for in the application are going to be that at some point so they'll ask for <laughs> similar like counts of clients, um, you know, possibly even broken down by demographics and geographic areas. So that might just be one area to, to think about or look at in terms of your data collection processes and capacity. That's something that, you know, could be helpful for many different funding opportunities, right? So if there are some areas there that might be worth taking a look at and seeing, you know, wh whether there's a need or opportunity to simplify or streamline, this could be a, an opportunity to do that. And then in terms of the outcomes, so I think if I remember right, in the small application, you're only required to, to name or commit to measuring one outcome. Um, and I'll double check the application to make sure I'm not giving you I'm looking wrong right information. Now. Yeah. But so, you know, so right there it's saying like, you don't have to, they're actually not encouraging you to throw the kitchen sink at this, right? It's like, be really clear about, here's the one thing we can measure and do really well. Uh, and especially it sounds like you all have, you know, evaluation tools or at least a tool that you plan on using. Um, and, you know, if the, sometimes even within evaluation tools, there might be like one question or one outcome from that tool, right, that you're going to measure. So it's not like you have to report on, you know, 20 different things. So that like that, that you know, would be probably a valuable part of the planning process anyway, as you, again, go through your theory of change and logic model. And, you know, if you do a kind of general logic model for the program, you might, in your logic model, identify three or four outcomes, maybe that you feel like, okay, these are the things that we, you know, this program is designed to do and, and produce. For core, we're gonna pick this one outcome to really focus on and measure. Um, and make sure we can do that really well. And so that's, you know, no matter what the reporting requirements are, that's probably a good process to go through anyway, but then it also might just help help it feel like, okay, we're proposing something that's going to be realistic <laughs> and feasible to do if and when we get funded. So I don't know yeah. if that helps. Um, it would also, how often there would be reporting, because some of our the things that we've already set up to measure are annuals, like client surveys. So if core is wanting something quarterly or, you know, twice a year, even though we were only intending to do it annually, just right. so that we're matching what we have yep. to do. Yep. Understood. Yeah, and those, that's good feedback to put in the hopper that I'm sure they're already considering, but we can re reinforce that. Um, the I did look on the application, so you you have the option to identify two accomplishments or or outcomes, but only one is required. So if you if you want to track two, you can. Um, I have a follow up question, just because it's in front of you. Yeah, is it an end of grant term outcome, or are we doing annual outcomes? It's is worded as accomplishment number one, describe a specific measurable accomplishment, parentheses, activity, achievement, or outcome to be completed with core funding by the end of the first year. Okay. The and then we just fill years. out one. We don't we don't say what we plan to accomplish year two or year three. Um, if if it is anticipated that progress on the measurable accomplishments will be different in year two and three, please describe. Okay. Okay, great. So, so the outcomes described is annual, but so if there's any quarterly or mid-year report, it might be simpler in just the number of people we've served, but not expected that we've measured that outcome yet. That's my understanding, yes. Very good. So you might say at the end of year one, we expect X, we expect to achieve X. And then um, you might be on a trajectory where you say, that's, that's the best we're gonna do. And then we're, what we're gonna do is maintain that. So we'll, you know, we're, we're not gonna have attrition or we're going to um, keep that number steady for years two and three. Or you might say, 
that's step one. And then we want to expand further. And then you would have a different number for a different metric for years two and three. And what the relationship of that to reporting is what we don't know. But it makes sense that what Serge described that there would be something like an annual client satisfaction survey or some kind of review that's not quarterly for reporting um, would apply to a lot of situations. So for our logic model where there was the um, interim goals and then the long-term goals, depending on our program, our interim goals may be six months and our long-term goals may be a year, but a different kind of program may have interim goals of one year, long-term goals of two years, just on what kind of service we're doing and what kind of change we're gonna be seeing. The, yes, especially the change. So we tend to think of long-term goals and to really have an impact in a way that builds from kind of more incremental change up front to take years, usually. Um, it, it can vary, but, um, but usually there's something that's right in front of you, things that you're already doing or planning to do in the very short term, in months or within a year, and then you're building on that. So what happens next? And then what happens after that? And core, the core conditions and the broad community level impacts that you see associated with each core condition do have those more aspirational longer term goals um, held up as the, um, the North Star. So um, it's possible that a long term goal would be within a year for a program, but I'm thinking mostly they would tilt further than that. Nicole, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, just to give an example, a program that I coordinate, a, <clears throat> a parenting program where I'm, on, I'm in your shoes, where I have to report <laughs> on outcomes uh, on a monthly basis, actually. And like the outcome itself is phrased as, actually, we have two outcomes, and they're phrased as like X percent of participants will demonstrate X percent improvements by the end of the program. So it's kind of like the outcome itself is just phrased in terms of like how many, you know, what percentage of our participants do we think are going to show some kind of improvement. And the outcome itself stays the same every year. Um, and then when we're reporting, we're just reporting, okay, at this point, how many participants have, have reached that threshold? So your numbers might change, like the, you know, it, in your, if it takes a while for, um, for you to reach that outcome and, it's, and you're not quite there yet in your first report, that's not, that doesn't mean it's a sign of failure, right? It just means that that's, you know, sometimes it takes a while. I think what the RFP is asking is, like once you come up with your outcome, like is anything about that outcome going to change significantly in years two and three because of the way you're implementing the program or because you are forcing some kind of big change or like the outcome itself would need to change? Like maybe you wanna increase your percentage of participants or increase the amount of improvement or change that they would be demonstrating. But that's not, like if, if that doesn't feel applicable, then you would just say, no, we don't anticipate any changes. This is the outcome that we would have for, you, for the three years. The actual numbers you report, you know, might, might change or look different um, in each report. But there isn't like the, ex I don't think the RFP is trying to set up the expectation that, oh, then like in year two, you have to come up with something even bigger and better <laughs> as your outcome or more people or unless that's part of your program design. So a follow-up question on that, could the outcomes be, so I come from the tech industry, which means it's a whole completely different kinds of outcomes we measure out there, but could the outcomes be related to a subjective qualitative feedback, like increased um, you know, stability, feeling of being supported, um, happiness, stuff like that can also be um, uh, outcomes that you could actually uh, strive to aim for? Absolutely, yes. And, and then the question is, how do you know that? So do you have, you know, what, what are the measures or metrics that you're using? Um, and, um, you know, what, 
what defines that stability for you, right? What what are the what are the the ways that you would know it's happening? Um, and on that point, would objective measurables be valued more than self-reported? Um, because I could see on some corn conditions they're easier to objectively measure you know, number of meals or something like that versus social connectedness and a feeling like health and wellness, uh, like the feeling that somebody has. Because that's what we're in the business to is grow yeah. connectedness and stability in self-efficacy, right? So, yeah. And so you're in a situation where, um, there, I mean, you're not alone in relying on self-reports. Um, and so, Serge, if I understand your question correctly, it's about the validity of that. So, you know, is, is something that, that you can point to and count and sort of quote unquote objectively see like the number of meals delivered or the number of uh, training participants who attended your course, something like that. It feels more concrete. Um, but there are so many things that are subjective in the eyes of the beholder and particularly in the eyes of the participant. So I think that the field, we can talk about this some more in some of the trainings, but the field of evaluation and of data and looking at data through an equity lens has a lot to say about who gets to say what a measure is and what's valid. And particularly in the example that you've been using about stability, um, and there's some parallels to this with, for example, recidivism in the criminal justice system. What, is, what does it mean? What does it look like? Who gets to decide? Um, what, what are the implications of looking at stability in this way versus that way? Um, what is the role of, for example, um, relapse might be something that um, some objective measures might look at as a failure and others might make a case for that's actually part of learning and part of growth. And it's rare for people to truly get to recovery without some kind of relapse. And so we factor that in. And what we'd wanna look at, I'm, I'm totally um, hypothetically saying this. Um, we look at um, relapse not as a um, a failure, but as a, we want to keep the intervals between relapse longer, or we want to track some kind of growth from, from relapse and make the relapse less extreme or severe, whatever, whatever that is. And th that's because of the addiction and recovery community changing measures of success for, um, for recovery. And so that's the only way that, um, not the only way, but a, a major way to get that is from the reports of your clients. So I, I think that subjective data has an important role to play in understanding the effectiveness of what you're doing. And maybe you can augment that with some other things, housing, permanence, employment stability, et cetera, and different measures of self-sufficiency and independence. But ultimately, if, if somebody who's in recovery feels more stable, they've repaired some relationships, what, whatever it is, then it's hard to say that that's less valuable than something else. If I, we, that, it might if be the most valuable. Um, yeah, exactly, right? If we had like, I think the cafe in San Jose does this happiness meter, right? Oh, they do a, right? Um, is that, is that, Correct. Uh, can they survey the members with, um, you know, uh, you know, like a like a four question outcome measure, like before, you know. So if we did something like that, where we could have them, um, you know, do a little meter, you know, maybe monthly, and see if they're feeling more confident, more happy, more secure in themselves, more, you know whatever, if that would be a true measurement to gather, something yeah. like that. Yeah, definitely. And that, you know, a lot of that is the, the, the network data that we'll be, uh, mm -hmm. we'll be compiling starting soon. Yeah. That, yeah. that sounds very interesting. I'd like to see that. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah we yeah. do that at the, as a baseline when somebody comes in and then we do that annually. And that's Great. where I started that. Perfect. Um, mm -hmm. A slight side question from this. Um, 
it makes sense to me that whatever outcome that we're deciding to measure relates to the core condition that we're saying we're addressing. And I think for me, one of the, like, I love the application. I love the process. I like Santa Cruz and the whole core thing and trying to make things measurable and, you know, applicable and outcome oriented. Um, choosing one core condition is my biggest challenge on trying to represent what my organization, what my program does. Because so proud of how holistic and how many, you know, uh, things that we, you know, touch on or how we can build somebody up and to say, okay, you have something innovative and you have something that's holistic. Now take out that word holistic and choose one and give me an outcome that's related to that. That feels very limiting for, you know, what we've been striving for. We so, had a conversation uh, about this earlier. <laughs> we did. We did. And um, so, Serge, first of all, um, it's the, the core condition that you're primarily addressing. So, um, and it's, it is unfortunate that it drives you towards one over others because you're not alone in wanting to be, um, and, and core itself wants, wants to connect all of these core conditions and, and look at the equity dimensions of across them and through them. Um, but I would say that you have an opportunity to make that case and you do not need to drop the word holistic at all from your description of what you're doing. So, so pick one, but you in the text explain the connection to others and why um, you will you will not have to sacrifice that aspect of your program in the in the descriptions or the outcomes. Um, that's part of the task of the the storytelling and and the um, design of what you're asking for. And I, I know this is part of the, the whole challenge is um, choosing what, what it is that you are asking for support for. But I just um, really wanna emphasize that you don't feel boxed in by that one drop down menu and the choice of a primary core condition because there is a, a text opportunity to talk about the connections to others. And um, please don't drop the word holistic from your description. <laughs> In a, in a practical sense, is, is will there be will funding decisions be based in in any part on making sure that there's a certain number of grantees under each of the core conditions, and would that play into strategizing which one to pick in any way, or because being able to explain it in other ways, you shouldn't shouldn't try to, try, try to guess or game it based on, well, you know, who are they gonna fund for each core condition? It's an yeah, excellent I, question. Go yeah, ahead. I would say like, um, because the county and city decided really explicitly not to set any amounts or criteria or, or priorities that, that they're uh, by core condition. Um, and so like the scoring criteria isn't going to be based on, you know, which core condition and, and there, there aren't any like, there aren't like any secret conversations that have happened like, okay, this amount we want to do, you know, for health and wellness and this amount or, you know, X percent for this core condition versus others. Um, so it, it is going to make the, the conversations that have happened is, oh, that's going to make the review process kind of tricky. <laughs> Like what do we do if, if everything comes in under one core condition or um, how are the reviewers going to decide and, and the county and city eventually decide what the funding recommendations should be? So and, I would say like, it, don't, yeah, I, I think that's the concern is that like trying to figure out like, how do we strategize? How do we, you know, increase our chances? And I think at this point, it's like increase your chances by making the best, clearest case you can. And for, I think the way to during, during the, the review process is, is would there be, is it um, what, would there be any chance that they might come back and say we like what you're saying, but would you consider changing your core condition? I mean, would they would there be an opportunity to amend that if that's what they and if, if everyone comes in under health and wellness, would they go back to certain ones and say you know you you know do do you want to rethink that and choose one of the others? Mm, that's a good I question, Ken. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I don't know that we can answer that, and I'm not even sure. I mean, we can ask that question or pose that, or you could, here's what I'll actually say. If you, if I, you 
are interested in, in knowing whether there's an answer to that question, that's probably best to send that to that county email address. Yeah. Um, yeah. Versus us trying to you know, give you a, an, a some kind of educated guess <laughs> or answer. Well, I think it goes back to that mapping proc process so that we can core down to our best presentation of what we do um, and then let that be the leading factor of which to say you know what i mean yeah i think i think you're i think you're exactly lot. on track Elaine. the best description of what you do best is never a wrong strategy in my opinion yeah yep i think that that's what we need to do the work i had a related question um i know what core condition i think our proposal f fits under but Earlier in the application, there's one on service category, and I can't find like a corollary <laughs> there. Oh, man. So I'm, I, but there's an other. I didn't know if there was a strategy. You said like pick the best fit, and that's what it says, but there's also another box. So use I didn't other. know like, yeah. It, if it doesn't okay. fit, just use other. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you go. But you have to say what the other is. I was just going to say this a lady described. I just yeah. make up my own service category. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, too. Perfect. All right, thank you. Awesome, I love it. <laughs> on the on the prior connection question that Ken was asking about about um, getting feedback from our application, I thought that there was some comment on in one of either in the RFP or in one of these discussions about what might be something that the program would be reached out to like tech did i was that not part of the process somewhere it might have been in the um question and answer i'm i'm, I'm scrolling through the q a document to see if that came up do you know nicole there's, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm looking at the timeline in February 15th. People are told if their applications are incomplete or do not meet par parameters. Oh, okay. But that's all I'm seeing for what the reviewers might be asking programs. Not saying, hey, like apply, you might wanna consider this and improve it or something. Well, I think Kent's was more about once all of the uh, RFPs are surrendered in, that if all the categories are on one certain topic, if they would come back and say, hey, you guys, maybe you might want to try this other topic. Yeah, uh, I, so um, so good questions and, and a good opportunity to clarify. So the what Serge was mentioning is, yes, there's like, as when applications are submitted, there's kind of this first review to, to make sure they're complete, they fall within the right parameters. It's basically, kind of determining which proposals are eligible to even be reviewed and scored. Like if they somehow didn't meet the parameters or criteria, then that they won't be reviewed. All the ones that kind of pass that first round of review then get distributed to the reviewers. And again, we don't know who the reviewers are at this point. Nicole and I aren't gonna be involved in that process. Um, but then once they review it, um, you know, they'll, score them there is from what i understand there's not going to be any kind of like communication back and forth between the reviewers and the applicants so there's not going to be like a hey you might want to consider changing this or can you tell us more about this because for government funding that opens up concerns about fairness like, and fairness. all that kind of stuff um and so there won't be that kind of communication but then in march at some point HSD and the city are going back to the board of supervisors and the city council with an update about here's how many applications came in in each of the tiers. Here's the amount, the total amounts that were requested in each of the tiers. Here are the primary core conditions um, that that people selected. Just to kind of give a picture of what the application mix looked like. If at that point there seems to be something that's like way off or like somehow it's just, it's not making sense. And there needs to be some kind of 
further direction from the board and the city council in terms of like how they want this to play out there that's the board's opportunity to do that the city council's opportunity to do that that will also be those will also be public meetings so applicants can also attend and you know weigh in or or say anything that they feel is is necessary um but i think you know at this point none of us know like okay will that lead to some kind of direction or changes about how much is actually funded in each core condition or in each tier. Like we just don't know at this point since the applications aren't in. Um, but that's part of the reason why that process was that step was built into the process, just so that before funding recommendations are actually made and announced that, you know, if there's a need to somehow adjust anything that it's done as part of the public process. And you know, we're over time. I just thought of one more question. It's a budget question, may I ask? Or should I enter in the document? Um, we've never submitted an application with, that includes indirect. So I don't actually, I'm thinking about, I was thinking about it to the grant reporting component. Is that a qualifying indirect cost that we need to like build in? Or is that actually staff time we need to build in to our personnel budget in order to do sort of that level of work. You, you mean the administrative time to do reporting for this grant? Where does it fall? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would say also the administrative, like managing the, well, that's probably separate, but I mean, yeah, if, if the grant was successful and we do the reporting, is that an indirect expense or, because I don't want to add staff time if that's usually covered by indirect. Good, oh, double dipping, like, yeah. Um, um, I was just looking at the Q and A document because that that was a slightly different question that came up about the indirect rates, about whether it applied to only the direct funding costs or the entire funding request. And I'm seeing the HSD said they can't answer that question at this time. I think they have to think think that response through a little bit more. But um, the times when I know. I've prepared or monitored budgets that have an indirect rate. Usually the guidance is if there's a staff position or role that is um, specifically like clearly working on the proposed project, and if part of that includes preparing the reports, that you include that as part of the staff like direct cost. Okay. The indirect is more of like the staff that might be involved in just like overall HR. contract management but like you can't really specifically identify like their you know what they do like an executive director is often a good example like they you know are responsible for overseeing everything in the organization but they're they may not like have a very clear and specific role in implementing the project so maybe their time is more indirect part of the indirect rate versus or like accounting staff right that mm -hmm. have to handle all the, the budget yeah the budget and invoices and all that kind of stuff in order to make the program work, but they're not directly um, part of implementing the project, if that makes sense. Yeah, extra time needed for the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. good, that's helpful, thank you. You're great, Stacy. nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too, <laughs> Elaine. Thank you for your support yesterday when I was sharing too. You were, you were always smiling and nodding. <laughs> Elaine is the most supportive. Um, we're, Aww, we're, thank we, you. we feel that way too. Thank you. <laughs> um, right, oh, sorry. Just on that last question. So it sounded like I should make the program manager do the reporting because I can bill for their time. As opposed to the program director, that that's only an indirect cost. <laughs> I like. Or which volunteer is going to be taken on the delegated, you know. <laughs> Probably I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's one to think about, but yeah. I mean, yeah. so much of it is, you know, dependent on how your program and your organization is structured. And so it might be a different answer for different applicants, but I would definitely think of it in terms of, you know, evaluation and reporting on a specific program, right? Like you can clear, you could clearly track those hours, right? That whoever it is, 
you're doing it for this particular program or project versus something that's more nebulous, like you can't really parse out, sure. yeah. you know? Um, and so that's usually the way to think about direct costs versus indirect costs. And so if that's, depending on who the person's, who the, you know, what role it is that's doing that function or how you treat that in your organization. Yeah, and, and some people do a percentage of a full-time equivalent, an FTE, um, to cover a variety of roles and tasks, and you want, you know, something behind that. Um, so it's not re unreasonable, but, um, you know, it may be something that's a part of someone's role and it's less important whose title that is than the fact that you've allocated some thoughtful time, some reasonable time to what needs to be done. We're gonna hop off and take a little break between our next, when this call and our next one, we may see some of you there. Um, and just please keep in mind the upcoming training. So we may see you next week or after that. And thank you for being with us for the great questions and keep them coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye Appreciate everyone. You guys. Thanks. See Bye. you guys later.